So if we could just uh, take our seats. Our next panel will be on AI and its impact on governance and security. And this panel will be moderated by Mike, one of my favorite persons. He's a really, he's a really good guy. <laughs> so without further ado, Mike. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for uh, being here with us today. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about our specific topic on governance and security. So I've got the privilege and honor uh, to be at the Gordon Institute spearheading a, a project that it, uh, is for cybersecurity resiliency across the state of Florida for public sector, municipal, and uh, state employees, you know, at the executive and, and managerial level. And it was mentioned a little bit earlier in, in the panel before about that resiliency and the talent here in Florida and that Florida is doing some things right, as you heard Provost Behar mention some of that. And, um, you know, you can't, there's certain things about these conversations that that security part, that component, that issue is at the heart of all of this because, you know, as AI is going to make a lot of our lives a lot easier and more efficient and all of these things, at the same time, it does introduce liabilities, it introduces new risks. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a very fitting time for us in Florida to take advantage of, of this opportunity because it feels like many things are converging at, a, at, at the just the right time where we can be ahead of policy making in Florida, taking into consideration you know, policies that help us innovate, that help us grow and keep us safe, right? So that, that project is, is run through uh, Cyber Florida, uh, the, the group back here. Ernie, Ernie personally, makes it a point that we make sure we stay, we stay up to date with, with robotic attacks and bring that over to, uh, to the legislators and, and, and our participants. Today we have a, a spectacular uh, cast here of panelists. <laughs> and uh, yes, yes it is. Um, very happy to, to, to be here. Uh, with uh, Anna Chamas, Tamika McKay, and Dr. Reed, um, each one of you uh, bring a fantastic perspective into governance and, uh, and, and some of the security issues. And Anna, I would love to start with you as far as, you know, Dade County, as far as I understand in the state of Florida, is one of the first counties in the entire state to actually take a very proactive approach in issuing uh, what's the term I'm looking for? In issuing, uh, it, you know, activating an initiative based on AI for the county. Oh, hi everyone. My name is Anna Chavez. I'm the director of innovation in Miami-Dade County. And yes, very exciting for us. Hopefully, on the sixth of February, our AI policy and report on artificial intelligence in government will be released to the board of county commissioners and to the public. It has been a labor of love. Um, it is, a, 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 I really feel, um, one of the things that Madeline said in the previous conversation was that we are just at the beginning. This is just the beginning. Um, I was looking yesterday at a, at a Gartner study um, that, talks, that was talking about AI adoption um, and specific to ChatGPT and comparing it to um, to adoption of Twitter and what took a million users, you know, for ChatGPT in five days to adopt a million users, it took two and a half months for Instagram. So it is insane, yeah. the rapid amount of adoption. But it's very telling what Dr. Singer was saying um, that only 17% of people understand what AI is about. And so it's very interesting that that when we put together the policy, one of the things that our board asked for was to really look at workforce considerations. And so seeing that, that the conversation over and over again is about talent management, 
and workforce development is going to be critical in adopting all of these policies. So we could put these policies together, we can codify things, but it, in order for people to embrace it, they really need to understand what we're talking about. You know, and the reality is, is that ChatGPT is a service. Then there is the whole monster that becomes what, you know, the models that are the basis of things like the service of ChatGPT. And then there will be workforce implications from people that are like prompt engineers. And those aren't technical people. So there's a lack of understanding in general, even amongst our peers, in what this is really adequate, like we're not adequately properly educating. And I think the previous panels and the keynote really were a great testament to that, which yeah. is what I was telling you about earlier. Yeah, so. uh, you know, that, um, that brings me also to envisioning, and, and here we are, Day County, being extremely proactive. And I know, Tamika, as the CIO of the largest city in Broward County, you guys are also envisioning some of these things. Can you speak a little bit to you know, what it's like for your particular city, um, given the, the complexities, right? Uh, and the nature of getting these things uh, you know, the buy-in and the moving and the adoption. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you should say that because, uh, well, first I want to give uh, kudos to Miami-Dade County under the leadership of uh, Margaret Bisprain for their forward thinking. Um, and that's one of the things I enjoy about public service is being able to partner with other uh, colleagues to learn from them. And really, uh, this agency has led, led uh, the path forward and uh, I look forward to partnering with them to bring some of those uh, initiatives to the city of Fort Lauderdale. As you mentioned, the city of Fort Lauderdale is the largest city in Broward County. And I, with the exception of Miami-Dade, uh, the three public organizations that I've worked for, they've always been behind. We've been more of a reactive, a reactive approach to technology. Um, it's just, you know, just hasn't been at the forefront. And really, believe it or not, in this day and age, there's still a lot of ignorance uh, or maybe underappreciation for the role that technology plays in achieving organizational outcomes. Um, the tradi traditional IT department, IT folks, we were back end. You know, my laptop's broken. We were an afterthought. We didn't even have a title maybe 15 years ago. We were data processors. And now, we've, with our digital economy and the digital revolution, we've really moved up from being a back-end uh, utility really to being strategic partners with the business on accomplishing those outcomes. And two things have to happen. Mm -hmm. The IT people, we have to get away from the gadgets and the technical terms and our little uh, scientific world and embed ourselves into the business, understand the business language, understand their challenges, understand their processes so that we can build and bridge that gap that really, and again, I'm speaking uh, from my experience between technology and the business and the government space. Um, and really, it's funny because I'm a techie at heart, but I would say the last five to seven years, I've really spent more time learning about the business, building relationships, building trust to help my yeah. business leaders understand where I can be a partner with them. Don't just see me as, a utility, okay, my laptop's broken, my cell phone's broken. I wanna be with you in the room when you're looking at that five-year plan and I wanna look at your problems and say, here's where AI or digital transformation can help you, but also bring those guardrails in to make sure that we're safe. Mm -hmm. um, helping them understand that um, data is really the new oil, right? And then the other part of it is helping them understand that it's not really about the technology. I mean, I talk to my team all the time and I says, nobody cares about our servers, our routers, our code. What they care about is outcomes. Nobody cares about the gadget that's inside the ambulance, but what they care about is a stroke victim now has a higher chance of survival yeah. because that gadget already communicated 
to the doctor at the hospital that a stroke victim is on his way. By the time they get there, everything's already set up. And what maybe would have taken 20 minutes is now five minutes and now somebody has a higher chance of living. And I think we need to have that same approach to AI. It's some, for some people, it's a buzzword, uh, just like the cloud. Oh, the cloud, the cloud, everybody wants to move to the cloud. Let's not just get caught up into the buzzwords. I love to quote Simon Sinek, what's the why, right? So from yep. the public perspective, it's not just about, oh, we're doing AI. What's the problem? What are we trying to solve? And how can technology, AI, enable those policies and those desired outcomes based on what that is. As long as we can stay on that and focus on that, then I believe with the guardrails, with the policies, with the buy-in, uh, with the community engagement, with the collaboration, we can be successful. Yeah. And, and you bring up such a great point, and we see this in, in the advanced cybersecurity trainings that, that we're doing when we're bringing in C-suite executives and managers, right? When we're, we're saying, hey, it's not the technology, because so much leans on the folks who are running the, the technological aspects of, of a government or a city. Um, you know, and you see eyes and everybody looking around every now and then, it's, it's not the tech, it's you. Yeah. The, the real element here, the real thing is that person. Exactly. Do you find, I mean, do you think this would be a much easier conversation because of how popular and how permeated it is into individuals' personal lives already to get some of this buy-in on saying, hey, we need to do something about this, right? How do you um, see that? No, the buy-in for me uh, is embedding myself into the business and understanding what their challenges, pain points, and needs are, and what their goals are, and then bringing in technology. If I walk into a meeting with my police chief and I talk about technology, he's on his cell phone, he's looking at the clock, he's wondering when I'm gonna shut up. But if I talk about crime, guns, protection, and how technology can help enhance that, now I have his attention, right? And that's the same thing that I have to do to my fire chief, the same thing I have to do to my director of uh, development services. So really the onus on me as a technology leader for the organization and wanting to do my part in helping us achieve those organizational uh, outcomes, I have to learn the business. Right? I have to learn what my police chief needs and how technology can help him get there. And when I get him to see that, now I have his attention, now I have his, his, his partnership, and hopefully I'll have his checkbook. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's a perfect segue for Dr. Reed. Um, Dr. Reed, you are the inaugural founder of uh, AI Squared at UF. Uh, you guys are doing some pretty uh, amazing things research-wise. Uh, can you speak a little bit towards you know this this whole thing? You you hear how government is is usually we're having to bring them you know help them motivate them get them to speed. How how is it AI squared in your work? Uh, can you talk a little bit to that effect? Sure, sure, absolutely. Thank you for be, letting me be here. I appreciate it. So at the University of Florida, like Miami-Dade College, we were fortunate enough that we made our bet in artificial intelligence pretty early in the game. So in January of 2020, we decided as a university that we were going to uh, greatly expand what we were doing in AI. And um, like some things that happen at universities, this actually was a donor-driven kind of top-down initiative. We had a former, um, we had an alumnus who wanted to uh, gift us with an AI supercomputer, a wonderful thing to have, but he also challenged us with a question and he asked us, if we give you this AI supercomputer, I know it's gonna supercharge your research enterprise, but tell me what else you're gonna do with it. And our provost really quickly said, we're gonna teach AI across the full breadth of the university. We're gonna layer this on top of any and every major because it's gonna be that important to our students. So we have 16 colleges at the University of Florida. It's, it's a very broad college, a very broad university. And we figured out a way to teach AI to any student regardless of their background. It doesn't matter about their math background or computer science. We're not starting with, you need to know how to program computers first and then move on. And of course, remember, we're doing this in January of 20 before ChatGPT was in our consciousness. But, um, but we have a course on ethics, we have a course on the fundamentals of AI, and then students can take a course that's in their major. So we have these wonderful courses like AI in the built environment for our architects and AI in social sciences for people interested in that. 
courses in criminology and, and in the hard sciences and, and in the arts. Um, and what we're doing in this initiative is demonstrating to students that you need this in that it's relevant to you for your career prospects in the future, and we really believe that, but also it's accessible to you. And so by, by telling students this is something that any student at the University of Florida can succeed at, we're really broadening uh, who gets to participate in this new digital economy, in this new digital world that we live in. So our hope is that as these students graduate from the University of Florida and move to the workforce, you have a much easier time convincing them of the role of data or technology in helping them with their job, whether it's in, in healthcare or medicine or logistics, transportation, you name it. Um, and so we've had good success with this. We've been at it for a couple of years now. We have over 250 AI courses being taught and somewhere between eight and 10,000 students taking them each semester. And so they're gonna come out with a certificate uh, that demonstrates they've been through these courses and understand how to apply AI in their given field. Yeah. I'd like to pose the next question to, to the group. And um, we're seeing here, you know, as far as this opportunity that we're having in Florida with the current makeup of our, of our legislative body, right? And, you know, I, I love seeing, we, we probably have the, the highest number uh, this, is, this is not fact, but at least it's my perception of we have a very young legislative uh, makeup, right? You look at the average age, and when you hear statements, you know, uh, from a senator or somebody who's, you know, prides themselves on never having ever sent an email, and yet they're legislating policy for the <laughs> entire country <laughs> on how we use the internet, you know, that that really creates uh, that really creates some some uh, issues there. For the state of Florida, and, and how do you all see, you know, what is the, the approach to, for the municipal agencies for, on the government side to, what do we need? What do we need to ask the legislators to give us to have policies in place that help us be successful in adopting these technologies, but also in making sure that the technologies create this equity for our citizens and our residents who are going to be on the receiving end of these things? Well, um, I'll start with something that was shared at a um, presentation yesterday, and I want to make sure I give credit to uh, Dr. Levy um, at NSU. Um, and he mentioned, he said, do you remember when the first car was built, right? There, were, there was no front window. Uh, there are no seat belts. Um, there were no airbags, there were no rules. You didn't even have to have a driver's license. There was no registration. And over time, as it proliferated and became more common, these rules came along. And really, it was a great way to um, reference where we are with AI right now. You know, it's, it's something that, that has tremendous potential, but there's also perils. Right? And I love what Dr. Uh, Dr. Singer said about the potential, the possibilities, as well as the perils. Unfortunately, a lot of those we don't really know yet. And if you think about from where the first car started to where it is today, um, you know, a lot of those things came about from accidents and casualties and things that, that happened. So um, unfortunately fortunately and unfortunately, that's really where we are with AI. We're at the very, very beginning. And there's so much we don't understand and so much we don't know. But uh, I applaud um, the provost who's, who spoke earlier about let's, let's get ahead of it. Let's not be afraid of it. Let's embrace it. I mean, think about prohibition. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, alcohol is bad. Let's ban it. How did that work out? Yeah. <laughs> so, it created uh, more of a demand. <laughs> yeah. In terms of Florida policy and how it could help us, um, going back to the, the question, um, it is really critical that we have the adequate funding, backing, and support from the state government. Um, because as local municipalities, we almost have our own little worlds that we work in, right? The county's a bit larger, and it's comprised of 34 municipalities. And so it's really critical that we focus on funding, on backing, on having, you know, on prioritizing our ability to be able to further explore these things because in government we have many budget constraints, right? 
And so as we develop the policy, there are so many, there is so much work ahead of us to prepare for a 2025 report that we're already anticipating all of the things within our report that we need to get done from developing a data governance model, um, which is <laughs> Margaret Brisbane's highest priority because like she said, you know, the data is the fuel. If you have a car, you need the fuel. The data is the fuel, right? And mm -hmm. so it, it is really critical that we are able to um, work with the legislature, but that we are not limited because each of us has our own perspective, which is something else that Tamika and I were talking about. Like there is a perspective that Fort Lauderdale comes with and a whole set of issues, rules, and, and, and internal legislations that are localized to that government. And so we don't wanna be limited by state government, but we want to be able to piggyback on if there are specific guardrails that are gonna be put to ensure we have security, um, to ensure that we do that, that we do mitigate the risks that are going to come from, you know, exploration of AI and embedding it in everything that we do within government, um, you know, and 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 the implications, you know, that where there could be a breach in security, a breach in privacy of a resident. There are so many implications to those types of things that that it's just not gonna be solved overnight. It's gonna require the conversations we're gonna have this afternoon so that we can urge the legislature to support us in very specific ways. And, and there have to be commonalities in the conversations that we're having to make sure that the way that they support us is almost tailored <laughs> to higher education, local government, you know, uh, you know, uh, citizen advocacy, you know, so we, we have to sort of look at the big picture and then, but also understand the needs of all the different, if for, for lack of a better term, the verticals within, mm -hmm. you know, how we're gonna be implementing yeah. and using AI, so. Yeah. I would add to that too, that the diversity uh, of thought is very important. Um, just as you said, you know, the nuances um, in Fort Lauderdale may be different than Miami-Dade and may be different in, in Gainesville. And um, I think um, it, the most important thing is that collaboration, building those relationships. Mm -hmm. Because if we look back at 9-11, 9-11 happened because of silos. You know, one yeah. agency was not communicating with the other. And I think the same approach has to be given towards AI and dealing with this and, and leveraging it with those guardrails. And that's gonna come from diversity of thought. We have to have all different types of uh, perspectives at the table. And if I had the ear of legislators and their staff, the one thing that I would point out is that the state of Florida is, could easily take the preeminent position in education in AI. We have universities like Miami-Dade uh, and the University of Florida and many others already working with the Florida Department of Education on helping to build out their curriculum for K-12, pre predominantly middle school and high school. Um, Mississippi just came out last week and said, or it was earlier this week, and said they're the first state that has a coordinated plan for education around AI, but they haven't done anything. We've already been doing a lot of work. So I would say let's fund uh, some uh, opportunities, and there's actually funds that aren't being used we could redirect, to really good education at the middle school and high school level, and uh, both through the Florida College System and the SUS universities, um, the wonderful work that Miami-Dade College has done in this area began with a joint National Science Foundation proposal that was funded between them and the University of Florida to build out their curriculum. The reason why I think this is so important, and, and as was said in the previous panel, it begins with educating faculty, is it's unfortunately too late in the game for colleges and high school teachers and so forth to be hired with AI talent. You can't go out and you can't afford to bring in new AI talent. It's too expensive. But you can train the people that you already have, or I should say educate. You could educate the people that you already have really effectively. And we've seen that in places like West Palm Beach, where we, uh, at Palm Beach State College, where we worked with their faculty to add educational components to what they're doing in AI space. And we're doing it at Tallahassee Community College and at a couple of others. So I would say let's put some effort towards sharing the resources that all of these colleges and universities have developed across the state and put Florida first at educating uh, their population in, uh, in AI. 
throughout yeah. all of uh, you, you, education. You, you bring up a, a great point, and um, one of the things I think that we have here at this very moment is the opportunity not just to lead as a state in the country, but to lead globally in this space, because mm -hmm. there's, there's still, um, still very little that has been actually put in place mm -hmm. You know, anywhere around the world, um, we've seen what what happened here in South Florida with you know technology companies relocating um, from other states, setting up shop here, uh, HQs, and, and not just technology companies, major financial companies coming in and saying, you know what, there's a friendly environment, supported environment in South Florida right now, and that's where we want to be. It helps that we do have a pretty good uh, tax <laughs> code in Florida as well. But that's one of the things that, that I think that, you know, I would like us to get across to our policymakers as they think about this. What, what else uh, should we be, th how should we be thinking about this from your perspective from that point? Do you see us as a globally competing, are we competing globally or are we just now competing for internally, right? How, how do we balance that? We, we feed, I mean, we are a global hub, right? Mm -hmm. And we are trying to establish global tech hubs here locally, um, starting with being a designated uh, tech hub by the EDA. Um, recently for climate tech. So we, we, we Floridians as a whole, if we come together, the universities, the governments, and you know, in the spirit of collaboration with diverse thought, I, I do believe we can have a global impact. I, absolutely. Um, and, and I'm not sure how that would impact legislation or policy but I think it does, one of the parts of our policy um, and our report on artificial intelligence calls for building a collaborative. It calls for bringing together academics, other governments, private sector partners, and coming together to build those policies, those standards, those governance models that'll get us all to the same place we're never going to be able to control um, the risks 100%. But that shouldn't stop us from moving it forward. And absolutely, I think we can have a global impact. We are the gateway to the Americas. So I mean, it, that, that by nature gives us that global reach. So um, I would first start off by saying, if we want to be leaders, um, we have to be visionary. We have to be strategic. We have to be aware of what's on the horizon. We can't just think about today. We have to think about tomorrow, looking at trends, looking at data, um, making strategic decisions. But I would also bring it back to what are we trying to solve? What do we want to look like? What are our priorities? What is our mission? What is our vision? And then once that is defined and agreed upon, bring technology and AI in to achieve that. I still think that there's um, a caution to, to start, to not start with the technology, but start off with the why. What are we trying to solve? What do we want to be? What do we want to see? What are those desired outcomes? If we don't start there and we just say, oh, well, what can I, you know, let's do AI, let's do tech. Um, I just feel like, and again, maybe it might be different in a private sector, but as a public servant, as a civil servant, you know, my goal is to improve the quality of life, um, to serve the community. So that's where I want to start. And what defines that? What does that look like? And how AI and technology uh, can help me achieve that? So as much as, yes, we want to be visionary, we want to be uh, aware of what's coming on the horizon and be aware of, uh, you know, the future, I still think we should come back to the why and what are we trying yeah. to solve. And I would just add, I, I, hope, I hope it don't sound like a broken record, but um, you know, one of the things about attracting top businesses, whether it's fintech or healthcare market or whatever to your area, geographic area, is you have to have top universities there producing the talent that you need to, to support those businesses. And you know, luckily in South Florida, we have that. If you think about Jacksonville, Jacksonville doesn't have an R1 university present. 
So I think one thing that helps is we have that base here. So long as those universities and colleges are putting out talent with AI skills and other things, I think that's a huge advantage for us. Um, but the state as a whole will be able to grow if we're also allowing uh, community colleges, state colleges, and, and other universities uh, to create that talent around them as well. So thinking at the state level, can we make a global impact? Yes, if we're working together towards those ends. Yeah. All right, we can't, we can't uh, continue here unless we actually start having a little bit more conversations on security. The security af aspects of all of this. Um, I, I'm just thinking Fort Lauderdale. You guys have been through quite, you know, quite a, quite a, a journey in the last uh, maybe 12 to 18 months, right? Yeah. Yeah. How do, um, let's talk a little bit about that. AI, you know, I'll give you a perfect example because even in universities, public institutions, you know, employees have access to large language models. Let's give Bard some love. I know there's uh, Google in here. Gemini. Now. Gemini. There okay. You go. Uh, <laughs> so, so we've got access to these things. We have employees who have access to these things. We don't necessarily have policies in place that say, hey, by the way, don't take our meeting agendas and put it in chat GPT or don't take, you know, so there's that risk there, right? that could potentially become a security risk. Let's not put our emergency plans, you know, let's not ask uh, chat GPT, uh, <laughs> you know, because you are giving that, now companies are creating different methods, you know, to address this, where um, it would be a more secure environment, where it's not necessarily going into their general public, uh, at least that's what they're claiming, into their general public uh, database. And I'm looking at you guys, Google. Um, <laughs> they, they, you know, there's those inherent risks there, right? Uh, intellectual uh, property. And uh, from a security factor, we're seeing countries, uh, we're proud of our F-35 uh, fighter jets. Boy, China sure did build something that looks a lot like <laughs> ours, right? So, yeah. you know, now this introduces a whole other level yeah. of, of uh, risk and liability. Yeah, absolutely. Can, absolutely. Can we dive into that security? Yeah. And yeah. we'll start with you. Okay. Um, well, for those of you who don't know, um, the, the city of Fort Lauderdale has had a very interesting past 12 months. Um, the uh, historic 1 in 1,000 year flood of uh, April, I believe it was April 12th, uh, 2023, when rendered our uh, city hall uh, entirely inaccessible. So uh, within uh, 24 to 48 hours, we had to evacuate uh, our data center. We had to evacuate over 300 employees. We are really currently still displaced. Uh, maybe about 60% of our applications are in the cloud, but we still had a lot of things that were on-prem. So finding, re re literally redesigning our network on the fly since a lot of our um, satellite offices came through that core office. Uh, and then in the middle of that, um, we lost our police station. Uh, so then we had another 200 individuals that we had to, to find place for. And those two core sites were where most of our uh, networks were going to. So uh, in addition to redefining, redesigning the network, uh, relocating displaced employees, trying to go live on our, uh, a new ERP system, um, new wow. city manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then later on in, in, in the middle of that, we had a business email compromise situation where uh, a member of our finance team inadvertently uh, wired $1.2 million to a bad actor. Um, oh so gosh. it's been interesting in Fort Lauderdale. But again, I'll bring it back to people. Um, no matter how brilliantly we design our network, our firewalls, our uh, multi-factor authentication, if our weakest link is the individual and they're not aware of the authority and the power that they have, um, we're missing the, missing the boat. So what we've really been doing the last, um, the last six months is really focusing on educating um, the individual user. You know, it's not just enough to have that annual cybersecurity training. But there's sometime this spear phishing where, you know, they, this particular, with the 1.2 million, it's common knowledge that we're using Moss as a construction company to build our new police headquarters. And it's common knowledge that the accounts payable supervisors, I mean, all this is public record, right. 
right? So bad yeah. actors are using this, can use this information to infiltrate uh, our weakest link. Who cares about a router? Who cares about a firewall? Who cares about multi-factor authentication when um, there's a human factor? So I would say from a security aspect with AI, with anything in digital transformation, it all goes back to the people, knowledge is power, educating your people, making sure that they understand that cyber, uh, cyber security is everyone's responsibility, not just information technology. Absolutely. Agreed 100%. <laughs> That's why we are actively training all of our, not only do we have the annual cybersecurity training, like you're saying, but we're taking advantage of the opportunity that, you're, that FIU is providing us. And we're actually, under the guidance of Margaret, just going full force and educating just the 1,000 <laughs> employees in our, in our IT department and then the goal is to do yeah. more than that. In March 13th, we're going to, you know, um, with the partnership of our CIO and, and FIU, we're going to be taking it to leaders across the region to come together to do that training because I don't know who in a panel before us was talking about leadership has to be trained, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Leadership has to understand. I think it was Peter that talked about 95%. Percent of people said this is really important, but only 17% understood, understood. Yeah. right? So if we take it back to AI, the implications for cybersecurity are fantastic because AI will help us drive and secure our environments, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we're going to have bad actors, right? Yeah. And so from the academic standpoint, it's really important that those, not only those ethical issues that impact the people that work in their space, but also the bad actors mm -hmm. that are not looking for the best interest of the people, mm -hmm. right? And so go in government, we're here to represent the people, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so we have to educate our workforce. Really excited we're working with Miami-Dade College. That's another training that we're going to do. So not only are we working with FIU for cybersecurity training, but we're going to also work with the college to educate the whole entire workforce. Right, so the when we educate on AI, it's going to teach not just the ethical considerations, the you know possible hallucinations that come from AI because you know it's trying to complete a thought and then it makes up stuff, and you know. But beyond all of that, it's going to just educate the value of what AI could bring. You know, the idea that your your chat GPT or robot or AI or however people want to call it can be your partner in completing your thought. We used ChatGPT and we used um, you know, various um, AI tools to build the actual AI policy. It was our partner in building something that was like started at 50 pages and we narrowed it down to 15, right? Yeah. And how did we do that? By you know, the human interaction that AI will require. And that is part of the education piece. We're not saying that ChatGPT or any type of AI, you know, uh, model or language, natural language model is a bad thing. We're just saying the human intervention is necessary yeah. and we have to retrain the workforce. Yeah. That upskilling yeah. is absolutely critical. I couldn't agree more. So at the University of Florida, you know, we have to take the annual uh, evaluations too about cybersecurity. <laughs> but what I really enjoy is we have all the phishing attempts that are mock phishing attempts yes. that send you to the cybersecurity page. Those are hilarious. And I got one just the other day. And as an academic, I just, I really chuckle every time I get one. I'm trying to quickly go through my email. I get something that says, you know, your Netflix account is blah, 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 and it has a link on it. And I'm thinking, I don't have, that's in my wife's name. Why did I get this email? And it takes a few seconds before I go, oh, this is one of those phishing attempts yeah. from my uh, CIO Elias, and, and I delete it and go on. But, but we do a lot of those, and it's a really good educational opportunity. But the other thing that I was going to mention quickly is, um, you know, we had the philosophy early on at the University of Florida in teaching these AI courses that many of our students may not go on to use this in their, in their career. They may not, many will certainly, but for those who don't, they're going to understand this digital world they live in so much better. And so you can almost think of it as a gen ed course where this is gonna help you in your life. And so we hope that that's the case for those who don't ultimately use it necessarily in work. Yeah. 
You know, you said some things and uh, you saw the Cyber Florida team uh, all smiles over there. <laughs> um, and, and, and it is, it's a human, you know, there was something amazing. So just this week, uh, the president of Argentina, Malay, went and did an address at the World Economic Forum, right? And somebody within the same day took it, took his address through, uh, through an AI and translated it verbatim into English using his voice mm -hmm. and his accent. Yep. And it's, you know, for how fast they put that out, it's incredibly good. Yeah. Because now, now we're, we've changed the dimension of, you know, there's a lot of times that, uh, that that knowledge and those things in real time pretty soon, we'll have panels of people who don't even speak the same language and in real time instead of having interpreters, we'll be doing, you know, an AI will be doing that translation in each of our uh, uh, accents and cool. those things, which right. is super cool, but super scary too, right? <laughs> <laughs> so just to uh, wrap it up here, if, if we can, you know, as far as accomplish just one thing this year, one message to our legislators, to our business community and all those things, as far as AI and how to think about this um, moving forward, what would that one thing be if you could uh, close oh. us out with that? Just to accomplish just one thing, not the list of 10, just <laughs> what one thing. I always want to accomplish yeah. more than one thing. <laughs> um, I don't think it would be necessarily for the legislature, or, or, but I think it, it, it fuels the success of proper AI implementation which is centralized data repositories and governance models, shared data opportunities with other organizations so that when we're building the AI models and the AI services that, um, that ultimately provide the services for the community from the government perspective, the data is the key. Mm -hmm. And we have never, um, you know, one of the things that our CIO says a lot and, and, and really has built an incredible analytics unit to overcome that is that we're data rich and information poor. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, really critical that we prioritize data. And I don't know how legislature will intervene or, or, or support, um, but maybe in enabling easier ways to share data would be very cool and that we have some sort of standardization and governance model where we can take from each other. I see the difficulty right now in being one of the leads for broadband and digital equity in the county, the efforts that we're going through to have to layer yeah. data technology from like eight different sources, sift through that data, find the anomalies. If we could actually have commonality, commonality I think it would be a lot easier for us to all work together and to achieve the things that we want to do individually. Uh, I, would, I would also like to um, commend uh, Cyber Florida and the state uh, for having that insight and bringing us all together uh, with the, um, the, the state and local cybersecurity fund and uh, all of the resources that we've been able to leverage. You know, that means a lot, especially to some of the smaller municipalities that don't necessarily have their resources. Um, so I'm very thankful for their foresight in doing that because I don't think that's happening in all the other states. And we personally have benefited tremendously from it. Um, I go back to the collaboration and sharing information. Um, again, if we look at the past, we look at history, 9-11 happened because we didn't think outside the box. We were inside a box mm -hmm. and we didn't connect the dots. I love that saying, I wrote it down, data rich, information poor, because that's exact, if we say that data is the yeah. new oil, Right, and data arguably is the most important thing, the most important asset for an organization outside of human capital. Why aren't we leveraging it? Yeah. We have tons of it. Yeah. But if it's not connected, if it's not aggregated, if we don't have the tools to sift through it and ascertain um, uh, insights, right, and trends, and use that for decision making and process improvement, then we're, it's a yeah. missed opportunity. So. Yeah. The continued collaboration, the continued thinking outside the box, the continued of embracing the possibilities of it with those guardrails, um, I think is where we need to be heading. Excellent. Yeah, and if I had the ear of the legislature, I would say that um, one of the things that Florida has going for it, especially in the AI front right now, is 
there is a tremendous amount of coordination between academic units, between academia and business and government and so forth. Let's take advantage of that, this, this willingness to collaborate, share information, share data, which is pervasive from where I sit. We've worked with a lot of other universities and municipalities talking about AI lately. Um, I think the time is right to, to create organizational structure around that, get people talking to one another, and put some money behind that. We've benefited greatly from the state. We had $20 million recurring to hire a new AI faculty. And so th we're will because of that, we're willing to give the return on investment and share everything that we have, the way that we're teaching, the way that we're preparing students and so forth. Let's bring some of that to bear across the state. Thank you. With that, um, I'd be remiss if I, I didn't give a shout out to the sponsors of today as well for helping you know uh, us gather this fantastic panel here. Cyber Florida, Lab 22C, Miami-Dade College. Uh, thank you so much for, for putting the muster behind us to, to help us pull this off. And with that said, thank you all very much. Um, if we could get a picture. Sure. Round of applause for you all. Give them another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, we will take a short break, a short 10 minutes break, and then we will be back uh, promptly uh, to convene, uh, to receive remarks from uh, one of our state representatives. So see you in 10 minutes. So we have the pleasure of being joined by Representative Demi Busada Cabrera, and she'll be bringing some brief remarks. Representative Cabrera, you can go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to join you today virtually. I had wanted to be there in person, but unfortunately, uh, we're in the second week of the legislative session, and uh, we had some committee hearings today and bill presentations, so I could not be there in person, but I appreciate you guys accommodating me. I know what you're doing is incredibly important, and um, you know I'm looking forward to you know hopefully sitting down with each of you in the future and learning how we can work together. Uh, just to kind of briefly talk about what's been happening on the state level, so um, you know I chair the State Administration and Technology Appropriations Committee, so I have the the pleasure of overseeing the cybersecurity technology type operations of the state of Florida from an appropriations standpoint, so the, the fiscal side of things. Um, last week in my committee, uh, we actually you know, hosted a panel discussion um, which had great participation from you know, uh, FIU, from Cyber Florida, USF, um, and other industry leaders and uh, the, the Technology Council as well. Um, we had robust conversation from the members of the committee, and I, I know, unfortunately, we had ran out of time and, um, you know, but we had lots of participation from the members and I think everyone is eager and excited to continue to learn about how the state and different leaders and partners throughout our state and throughout the industries um, can work together. So some of the things that, you know, we've done from a state perspective, I'm sure that many of you have heard of the training program, um, the cybersecurity training program that we've put out and um, Cyber Florida has been assisting us with. Um, so we're looking to continue to get more participants within that program. Uh, we did a, a local cybersecurity grant program um, the past couple legislative sessions that our local governments could participate in as well. Um, from an AI perspective, you know, I think that we're kind of getting started in this arena, and that was a big part of why I wanted to host that panel discussion, you know, last week is what can we do as a state? What should we be doing? So a lot of what we have been doing is just, you know, um, using different AI initiatives in our government operations, um, you know, that make it easier, more automated transactions um, where citizens or government employees have less of a wait time when they need government assistance, um, whether that be through Department of Revenue or DORA um, and Department of Health and different licensing issues like that. 
Um, and then, you know, right now we have an initiative where some of our prisons are actually going to be conducting a pilot program. Um, there's a, a request out there for about seven prisons throughout the state to do a pilot program of AI monitoring of inmate calls. Um, so we're going to take a look at, you know, how that progresses and how that pilot program works and see if that's something that we're going to, um, you know, expand on in the future. Um, I know that I've been asked a lot, you know, what kind of legislation do we think the state should be doing or is going to do? And there are a couple bills out there. I know it's always, this is always a challenging topic, though, because AI is constantly evolving and it's going to be significantly different, you know, six months from now, a year from now. And when you codify something into statute, into law, um, you know, you don't want to, one, stunt the growth of uh, something that could, you know, potentially be helpful, but you also don't want to you know, limit yourself in putting something in and codifying it into law um, by, you know, not being able to continue to grow because the industry is constantly changing. Uh, but I am excited to, you know, work with those of you that are participating with FIU um, and our other industry leaders um, who are there today um, and, and see if it's not something that we can get done this session or maybe it's getting it started and getting it off the ground going. And um, we come back next legislative session of how can we work together and be good partners. Um, I appreciate each of you, um, you know, taking the time today to do this summit. It's incredibly important. It's something that, you know, I hope we can continue to grow on. And I hope that people will look to us as leaders in, you know, the technology, cybersecurity, AI fields. Um, I want to help each of you. And I hope that you would want to help the state of Florida in becoming an industry leader that others can look to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Cabrera. Uh, and we look forward to continuing the conversation and the work. Uh, as Brian would have indicated earlier, one of the outputs of this uh, summit uh, is, is that we, and later on today, we'll be discussing uh, some position papers on key areas and aspects of artificial intelligence and how it's impacting and shaping our lives and policy and so forth. We, we, we will be moving that conversation uh, further after this summit. Uh, or next, uh, we'll continue the conversation moving along. Uh, we'll be having a fireside chat with one of our very own, uh, well, led by one of our very own, Mr. Randy Pestana. He's the Director of Cybersecurity Policy at the Gordon Institute here at FIU. And he will be joined by Kristin Emery, the Director of State and Local Government Affairs at Microsoft. So we're giving them about a minute or so to get mic'd up, and they'll join us uh, in a moment. Very excited uh, about our speaker. Uh, I know a number of folks in the room have partnered with Microsoft, uh, FIU certainly being uh, one of them. Uh, interesting fact, Microsoft was the first to invest in FIU's cybersecurity policy programming. Um, uh, and really helped lead a lot of the way in terms of educating, training, uh, not just the future workforce, but the existing uh, cybersecurity workforce across Latin America and the Caribbean, and then extended that uh, to our work uh, here in the Balkans. So i um, very excited about our next uh, fireside chat. Just have a discussion um, with Ms. Kristen Strobel, uh, who is the Director of State and Local Affairs at Microsoft. Also uh, spent time working very closely in legislation in Ohio, uh, not quite as nice as Florida, but, um, but uh, Ohio nevertheless and knows and sees the progress. So I wanna please join me in a round of applause for Ms. Kristen Strobel. So, testing, I testing okay. we got it. So I really wanna start the conversation looking at obviously your role within Microsoft what does that look like and what are some of the kind of perspectives regarding the AI policy debates coming out of Microsoft, but also your work with the different legislators around the country? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm director of state and local government relations and we have a whole federal team which spends their time with the White House and with uh, Capitol Hill, but I'm where all the action happens, which is state and local. I'm in Tallahassee a lot. In fact, I was in Tallahassee for several days this week. It was way colder than what I had expected, <laughs> but um, still a lovely time there. 
Um, I got my start in Ohio politics, as you mentioned. I worked in the state senate there, um, working on legislation as an aide, and then I worked for the attorney general of the state of Ohio, who's now the governor. So kind of made the trajectory up to a statewide office. And then the last 10 years, I was, was in DC working for um, trade associations. I actually lobbied on video games, which is how I met a lot of the Microsoft people. Um, but now in my role, um, I have states in all four time zones. So that keeps things interesting for meetings and calls. Um, but the last about year and a half, everything has been AI, AI, AI. Yeah. So we at Microsoft care about a lot of issues, but that is definitely a top priority for both state and local. Um, so every state's different, which is unique. But like I said, most of the action is happening there. Um, a lot more so than in Congress, which seems to be stalemate <laughs> most of the time. So um, I, I love um, the role. I've developed a lot of relationships with local elected officials, like a mayor or city council who goes on to run for state legislature and eventually sometimes for governor or other statewide offices. Um, so I love the relationship part of it and the human component, because you have to have the human component as well as AI you know, in that, in that discussion. So that's kind of a little bit of my background. No, it's phenomenal, and I think it's... It Thinking about that, thinking about the experience and seeing that work from local to the state level, and obviously you've had that experience working across from state to federal, what are some of those kind of key considerations as, as we start to think about policies, not only that we need to draft, but policies we need to ultimately adopt and get that passed to the legislature? What are some of the key considerations that state legislators should consider when drafting or pushing forward a specific AI-like policy? Mm -hmm. Well, first I'll give credit to the state of Florida because you guys are one of the leading states in wanting to do something in the AI space. I think when I left Tallahassee yesterday, there were over 16 bills that were filed, something related to AI. Um, some get in silos of their definitions um, while others are more comprehensive, but Florida is definitely a leader in that space. Um, but what I've noticed, not just in Florida, but in other states is there's no definition in the state statute for AI. So I think that sounds like a basic thing to be discussing, but creating a definition of artificial intelligence in your statute, it would be um, wonderful. Um, and rather than just having it referenced multiple places, um, so a definition. And then last year, um, Florida was, again, another leader in passing. They're one of 12 states that has passed a comprehensive privacy law. And so um, Senate Bill 262 was passed by Senator Bradley. and. We were supportive in that process of her moving that forward. Representative McFarland was the House sponsor. And states that don't have a data privacy or protection in place and you want to move forward with AI, I think that makes it very challenging. We at Microsoft view it as like parallel. If you're going to be working on or moving forward with artificial intelligence, you have to ensure that people's data is secure and private, especially when we're talking about what foreign actors can be involved in in artificial intelligence, for better or worse. Um, so having a solid foundation of data privacy law is important in the definition. Um, and then kind of seeing where the local government's role is. You know, if, if, if and when the federal government's going to act on some AI stuff, we can't necessarily at the local level wait. So states are having to serve as somewhat of the regulator. And it's an ever-evolving space and constantly changing, constantly evolving. If we think about, like, autonomous vehicles, first it was just, like, the research and looking at them. And now uh, where I live currently in Scottsdale, Arizona, you can take one from the airport home without a single driver in there. So they're active on the West Coast of um, you know being able to have riders. And, and, and so seeing if we were to have legislated on that to now, it's ever-evolving technology. So I think the flexibility to continue to evolve and amend and add on um, the regulation that we have is important. But again, reinforcing that we are protecting people's data is super important to us. And then also, like artificial intelligence is not replacing humans. At Microsoft, we have a product called Copilot, which is, we truly believe is your assistant that is helping you through the process to streamline your work, to improve your experience on our platforms, the software that we have. And of course, our competitors and friends and partners in the space have their own definition. Um, but it, it is very important that there is the human component that exists within AI, and there is a control, and there is regulation, and there is a human overseeing um, some of this machine learning. So those are a couple of things that I think are good foundations for what an AI bill would look like. Yeah, you talked on a, a lot of different points, and as the old saying goes, a lot of all politics are local, right? Yes. And we have a lot of a number of local officials here. 
What is the conversations at the local level and how much is that demand pushing, particularly up to Tallahassee in the state of Florida, but across different states? You have different municipalities. They might not always have the same priorities as, mm -hmm. as well as like I think Miami-Dade County vis-a-vis -vis Duval County. What are the conversations at the local level and how does that look in terms of pressuring or incentivizing the state to act on mm -hmm. certain efforts that they frankly can't afford? I don't have the exact date in mind, but I will give Miami-Dade credit for they were one of the first large cities or large counties in the country to move forward with an AI um, task force to look at what AI could do for the government and how it would impact um, their workforce. Um, so I commend um, Florida for and Miami-Dade specifically for being a leader in that space. Um, but when we look again, not to say Congress is so slow acting, but we can't rely on waiting for the federal government for privacy law. There has been no federal privacy bill that's been passed. So for better or worse, states, local governments are having to make up this patchwork um, of their own version of what makes sense for data privacy. And I think we're seeing that for AI too. Like states are like, we're not going to wait for uh, the federal government to do something. Or, I mean, in October of last year, the White House came forward with an executive order on AI. And while that's wonderful, it's examining and helping how AI is used at the federal level and federal agencies. That's not applicable to us here in Florida, you know, or Miami-Dade. And so state and local governments really have to look at what regulation and implementation is going to work for them and their constituent base. And so I think that it's like separate, but also like a synergy of like we have to do something if someone else is not going to act. No, absolutely. And big shout out to Anna Chamas and Miami-Dade County and all the other folks. Uh, uh, they really pushed. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So appreciate all the efforts that you've done uh, for, for our county. We talked a lot today, uh, and you, obviously you have the government's role in passing poli drafting, dra pol passing and then implementing mm -hmm. policy. And then you have the educator's role, and we talked a lot about that earlier today in terms of understanding what those key competencies and skill sets are needed in the educational system to enter the future workforce or how mm -hmm. AI is going to impact the workforce. What is the role of the private sector? Obviously, Microsoft, I see Google here, but a number of different major companies that frankly have a key influencer on legislative processes. Mm -hmm. What role does business play in that AI policy debate? Mm -hmm. um, like Google, we have been one of many companies that has tried to work with the White House and with states um, regarding implementing responsible and ethical ways to use AI. Um, but we at the private sector we're not the only experts, right? We want to be a trusted partner with governments as we're working forward and having a conversation about what looks best for constituent base, workforce, training. Um, one thing that the private sector, we are happy to lean into is when a state or local government has created an AI task force to look a little bit more on what are the benefits and potential downsides or downfalls from AI. Um, we're big promoters of state and local investing, and this includes university systems in research and development. But not just for AI itself, also training of workers, training of students. And there is a large portion of the workforce that are going to have to be trained on how to utilize AI. If you think about like a generation or two behind me, they can do way more things on their phone than I'm ever, <laughs> ever capable of understanding. And I think about that too with the workforce of if we are going to have AI in place to help expedite or streamline some of our day-to-day -day tasks, there has to be a training component. Um, universities that are now offering classes in AI, um, degrees, um, credentialing on additional training, all of those things that are important that we at Microsoft or other um, friends in this space can help be a resource. Uh, but it's really about a partnership of, you know, we have some ideas, but we don't know everything. And it's an ever-evolving technology, as you know. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned, obviously, supporting task force and, and things like that. Just thinking broadly beyond the state of Florida, obviously, you work across four time zones, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. What are some of these AI policies looking like that are being passed across these states? And, and what are some of the lessons learned? Certainly, you know, best practices, but there's some poor practices out there. So what are you seeing in terms of other states and what states are more successful, what are those kind of policies looking like? Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, there's the White House executive order. But I will say that several states are not necessarily um, enthusiastic about following that or wanting to do their own thing. So we've seen, I think at this point, eight or nine governors have um, 
introduced an executive order on AI to see how the their individual state can utilize AI for their workforce and their government operations day to day. So they're taking a step forward. I know your governor here is very busy, so that's, <laughs> it's definitely something we've talked about with his team. Um, but you know, it, those states are, are leaders in that space. Um, there is a representative here in Florida, Representative McFarland. I just mentioned her recently because she was one of the lead sponsors for the privacy, privacy bill. So she understands this very well. Um, she's uh, the sponsor of the comprehensive AI bill right now that's in the state house. And um, it's taking the lead inside of her bill is looking at the research end, looking at the, uh, creating a task force and, and kind of having a both public and private partnership um, in that discussion. Uh, she's also part of a working group that includes 43 states and over 100 legislators. That's being led by a state senator in Connecticut, Senator Maroney. He is getting all, for the last like six, eight months, he's been getting legislators together from across the country, blue and red states, to talk about, hey, how are we going to look at AI? How are we going to look at people's privacy? How are we going to be responsible, ethical? How are we going to protect to ensure that we have civil, civil liberties that are being upheld and that there's no bias? And really looking at it in a thoughtful way. So your leaders here in the state of Florida have been a part of that working group, which is great. Um, but it's early, right? There were over 190 bills that were related to AI that were introduced last year. We're anticipating several hundred this year across the country. Uh, and some are comprehensive, like Representative McFarland's bill, but others are very specific. Like they want to just address deep fakes or how campaigns are going to utilize AI or how it can impact workforce or um, children and, and deep fakes on, online and how you know, all of these AI images and things that are coming out, um, there's different regulations for that. So there's some states that are doing really well, only a couple last year that we can point to. Um, but I think Florida is ahead of the curve as far as leading in that they want to get something done this year, which is great. So I think executive orders from governors are a great thing to look at. Um, the bills that are inclusive of task forces are wonderful, research development, training for humans on, on AI. Um, and then speaking to kind of other states of what's worked and what's not worked. So allowing like pilots, um, test cases, yeah. demos that we can partner as a private sector entity with the state to say, hey, does this work for you? Um, does this work for your constituent base? I was recently in Indiana and they were talking about we don't have a great constituent experience when you come to our website of sending us out to local governments and having the local governments come back to our site and being able to talk to constituents to ensure they have a great way to talk. And I was like, oh, there's an AI chat bot that can send you to the right place and these yeah. things. So sometimes like hearing what the government customer needs and what will matter to the constituents to streamline their experience, that's a huge part of what AI is trying to accomplish is making things easier. And what it sounds like to me, and you mentioned red states, blue states, that AI, similar to cybersecurity, is a nonpartisan issue, right? There's a lot of political will. Are you are you seeing that nationally? Totally. And even in the you know the U.S. Senate, which sometimes can be a huge gridlock, um, Josh Hawley, who's one of the most conservative U.S. senators in the country, is on several bills with Amy Klobuchar, a very you know, blue-leaning state um, senator, and they're working together on several things, whether it's cybersecurity, deep fakes, how algorithms are tracked, all of these different issues, and it's become bipartisan. I know for a fact that it'll be bipartisan here in Florida when some of these AI bills are moving forward or they're co-sponsored that way. So it's a nonpartisan issue. I think different parties are viewing AI and the outcomes years, anticipation, successes of maybe a little bit differently and wanting to have influence there, but it is definitely a nonpartisan, bipartisan issue, for sure. And that's a blessing in this day and age here in the United Love States, it. certainly, right? Love it. Uh, I do want to <laughs> shift over, right, because there's often the negative arguments that are made about AI and the way AI is going to impact, uh, and Brian Fonseca and I did calculator math. Uh, again, we're a political science and international relations major, so uh -huh. we took out our Babbage calculator and figured out that if successfully implemented over $22 trillion in economic growth, additional economic activity will come to the state, right? That's phenomenal. Think about how many, it's billion, I'm sorry. I used their extra zeros. <laughs> um, but thinking about $22 billion annually, 
right, of additional economic activity, what are, the, what are those things that could come for it? So, so what is the economic argument, aside from obviously the whole numbers, what are you seeing from the private sector perspective, the ability to reinvest in local communities and districts like Miami-Dade County? Mm -hmm. So what are you seeing from the economic argument of the AI side? I think there's the constant discussion about like this is, would replace workforce, and that's not the answer or the case. AI is going to, as I said, streamline, make things easier, we can do our jobs faster, more efficiently, potentially hire more people to fill jobs. And then where there is a, an area where we cannot fill a job, like maybe a call center, if you have hundreds of jobs that are sitting empty, could AI serve in this space? So it's filling in and making sense economically for the workforce. Um, that's gonna be ever evolving. That's not something that we're gonna see overnight. Um, but governments like Miami-Dade that are investing in, like I said, workforce training, I think, and putting research and development dollars in place are going to see the, the positive outcomes. And um, economically, I think the growth in the workforce and the, their utilization of AI will just take off. And so I, I think it's an ever-evolving conversation, but I see a, a significant amount of potential that can come from AI. Yeah, I'm genuinely optimistic as well when it comes to AI adoption and utilization. But what are some of the challenges? What are some of the challenges that you see that oftentimes maybe will move too fast or maybe will overregulate? Or what are what are some of the key challenges and the debates that are going on that that might not be as expected? Great question. And I, we see this federal level and state and local of like as technology is evolving very very quickly and we're trying to regulate it. Are we catching up? Are we getting ahead of our skis too fast? Um, you know, if we put something in place that prohibits innovation, uh, your governor here had said something about that recently. Like, we want to make sure that there's this fine line between a regulation, but also not hindering our research and development and innovation and intellectual property to thrive um, for those that are creating and utilizing AI. So, you know, it's it's that again that nice marriage of making sure that there's enough. Um, but not too much that could hold anyone back. At Microsoft, we have a responsible AI office and uh, take a lot of these things into considerations, whether it's an ethical question, um, a bias question. We're very open to and transparent about receiving feedback and information. And I don't want to look at my notes, but I want to make sure I cover some of the things that are included in our responsible AI office and I think are important for AI fairness. Like if we're going to create AI, we have to treat all people fairly. We can't pick and choose um, whether it's a political party or a way in which we're serving information. Um, we have to, and a small inventor of AI versus a large company, you know, we need to be fair to everyone. Reliability and safety. I, I talk about this all the time, but we have to have strong privacy laws in place. If we're not protecting consumer data and AI, then, you know, yeah. it won't work. Um, privacy and security, you mentioned the cybersecurity um, portion of this, and you know there are threats of a foreign actor, and mm -hmm. how will that play with AI? And so making sure that there's a cyber and, and privacy component is important. At Microsoft, inclusivity is incredibly important to us. There have been discussions about civil liberties and bias in the way that these, because these yeah. machines are created by humans and the information that's put in, we want to ensure that everyone is respectful to each other on these platforms and that it's providing it to the best of our ability answers that are fair and, and reliable. Um, we want to be transparent in how our systems work and not have this <laughs> hidden cloak. You know, yeah. we want to be open with our customers and consumers and government customers especially of what we're doing, what we're making and our process. Um, and accountability, like we, and I know our competitors are in this space are, we want to hear from customers of ways in which we can improve. We don't, we know a lot, but not everything at Microsoft. And so we are open to hearing from research, development, universities, governments to hear of what are you seeing? What could we do better? How can we be better? And so a lot of those resources in our individual office are important to us. Those are things that we've shared with governments, shared with the White House, because these principles are like foundationally very important to us. Yeah, and I know the federal government's been really pressing this idea of secure by design and how AI can be integrated into the process to ensure that uh, users are protected. Now, we, if we can talk briefly about the people problem, mm -hmm. obviously there is a, a workforce shortage. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a discussion about AI disrupting. I'm not saying eliminating the workforce, mm -hmm. but certainly disrupting the way that business is done. 
Uh, Microsoft's been a leader, obviously, with community college investments mm -hmm. as part of the White House initiative and, and a number of other training efforts for veterans and for women. You know, what do you think are the critical things that, from a people perspective, if I am a citizen that's going to be impacted or utilizing AI, what are some of those competencies and skill sets or what are the advice that you might have for that individual that's going to be going into this AI-impacted world? Mm -hmm. I think with ever evolving technology, new things can be scary. Yeah. Um, I know, like in the late 1960s, when the introduction of ATMs came forward, all bank tellers were like, "My job's eliminated. I'm out. I'm done. I have no future." And in fact, over the last 50, 60 years, bank tellers' jobs and bank managers have more than doubled. So I think that there's a way that technology can scare you at first, but maybe can be an asset, and then you can focus your job on other things instead or streamline the work that you're doing. Um, we talked about it so many times, so training. Training yeah. these people um, that are gonna be utilizing AI, training students, I think we're gonna see a huge wave of, um, Microsoft owns a company called LinkedIn, so we already are seeing some of the job reports of, for the first time ever, kids are, Young students are having um, AI as a degree or a credentialing on their um, on their uh, profile, and so that's that's a great trend that we're seeing. But training workforce, investing public and private sector in training workforce on AI, so that there's a comfort level um, participating in demos, so that yeah. you can see how this is actually helping. Listening to your constituent base of like what ways do you think AI could help streamline or make your experience better? What is it that we're doing at the county or city that could make everything better for you? So having those discussions. And some of those things come up in, in our um, task force or workforce discussions. Um, but I think that education, investment, and training are huge in this component. Yeah. We only have a few minutes left, mm -hmm. so I'm going to ask you, I saw you with your luggage, take out your crystal ball here a little bit, right? <laughs> a lot of luggage. Right. So <laughs> I've we, been in Tallahassee we, for a while. <laughs> there you go. So we, we, we've talked a lot about how you've seen the demand by legislators to look, review, write, and pass AI-related policy. So thinking, and I'm not going to take you five years down, I'm going to take you maybe two years down the road. Mm -hmm. What do you think some of these AI policies look like that are going to be passed at the state level? Yeah, so one of the things I referenced earlier is that I'll say two separate things. One is the legislature, one is the executive branch. Governors, several governors have pushed forward these executive orders, and I know like Miami-Dade County has and other local governments. Um, that is allowing these governments to look at what's working and what's not working creating sandboxes to kind of try and train and, and see what works for, for them and their constituency. Um, they also, a lot of them put a timeline rather than just saying, hey, we're going to create a task force and arbitrarily look at this. It's we want to report to the governor by X. And so having that feedback of looking at it for maybe two years, three years, whatever it may be, six months in some cases of what AI is and the White House is doing this as well, what is benefiting their government agencies and what is hindering, and how will AI look to impact or hinder or hurt the workforce. So looking at all of that, I think from the executive branch is a really, really good thing. And then, like I said, there was almost 200 bills last year on AI, so we'll see what comes out. We're in the <coughs> early stages, I think with the bills that are coming out this year that get passed, I think we'll have a better idea. But I don't think that it, just if you guys pass in a comprehensive AI bill that you're going to be done. There's always going to be something additional that's going to pop up, and we're going to have to react to that and regulate and, and, and further um, move forward with legislation. So we'll see. There's not an existing state like model <coughs> bill that's out there yet that has passed forward. Um, California last year was very close to getting something passed, um, but but did not. And so we're going to see people that are part of this AI working group, like Representative <laughs> McFarland and others, um, will probably have some great examples to look to. look to. But I think it's ever evolving. And we're going to just learn the more that we're utilizing it, what else do we need to do to add to make it better? Yeah, phenomenal. And I, 30 minutes runs by really, really <laughs> fast. So so I, I, I do appreciate your time and, and I thank you for the insights and, and look forward to seeing obviously uh, not just uh, what you're pushing in different legislators, but what Microsoft and the private sector mm -hmm. is going to do to support 
academic institutions, public sector, local yes. municipalities. So thank you for everything you do and certainly everything yes. Microsoft does and uh, appreciate the partnership. One more thank round of applause, please. For I hate to be the one standing between you and lunch. So without further ado, we will go to lunch now and we will return for our final panel uh, titled AI and the, its impact on the economy and society. Thereafter, we will go into our breakout rooms to discuss our position papers. So lunch is on the outside. So as you exit either of these doors, you will see uh, a beautiful spread. And I encourage you to have your fill. Uh, we can eat in, in this room or anywhere in, in the space around. So see you back here in an hour. All right, thank you. <laughs>